As you get older, you need to focus more on genital stimulation because visual doesn't cut it. Okay. So basically a hand job can keep you going. Doctor says, <laughs> Hand jobs are the for best. everyone. <laughs> Hand jobs for everybody. We were toying with the idea of doing this podcast naked. We talked about it earlier. People, don't worry, that won't be me. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm talking to my patients about erectile dysfunction, if we start with that, I'm like 40% at 40 and 70% at 70 may have erectile problems. Uh, and I had all these problems, the crippling insecurities of my leg, uh, absolutely hated the, the way that I looked. I remember that I couldn't actually get changed in front of her in my own room. You know, this person's really hot and you really fancy them when you're on a first date, but you've got a really like a chicken nugget because you are actively suppressing that. Mm. So you need to be chilled out to mm. allow that system to switch off and your parasympathetic to take over. So it then gets flooded with blood and you're like, ah. Oh. The question that everyone wants to know is, does size matter? Hi, and welcome back to The Men's Manual, a podcast designed to get real men talking about some of the real problems they are facing and open up the conversation about men's health specifically, unpacking a load of topics, many of which are considered taboo. I'm Sean Stafford, your host for today. I'm a manual ambassador, and I'm here to help navigate these fascinating conversations with a guest who'll share their personal story and an expert to explore the science behind the issue. This episode is one I'm sure we'll have a lot of fun with, but actually I think it's going to be really fascinating and enlightening, not only for me, but for all of you watching at home. It's titled, How Well Do I Know My Penis? And I'm sure no man will want to admit they need to learn more about this. However, I think it's going to be really valuable to explore some of the host of subjects considered taboo whilst filling in some gaps in education, whilst pushing back on the lack of openness around men's sexual health and how this can cause problems for young people now, as well as in later life. I'm joined by Mo Samuels, a health, fitness and transformation coach who has had his own journey with health to share, but has also spoken openly about masturbation and pornography use previously on his YouTube channel. Mo, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us today. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. It's gonna be a good one. Uh ready for a conversation. Mate, I'm loving the energy you're bringing already. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also joined by Dr. Anand Patel, a specialist in men's health, sexual function, and fertility. He's appeared on the likes of Embarrassing Bodies on Channel 4, so he's no stranger when it comes to the more delicate areas of health, and in particular, men's health. He's gonna be giving us a detailed insight into the male anatomy, and hopefully be myth-busting some common misconceptions and untruth around men's sexual health. Thanks for joining me guys, and let's get started. Mo, welcome to the Men's Manual. I know you've got a lot to share, but I think a really good place to start mm -hmm. would be, how have you got to the point of doing what you're doing at the moment? Um, for those that don't know, it's a bit of, a, a bit of an interesting one really, because I got slung into fitness kind of accidentally. Uh, I suffer from a condition called lymphedema in my leg, which I've struggled with since I was around 12, 13 years old, uh, been hospitalized many times, and it's been a reoccurring theme throughout my, throughout my life where I've been kind of strung with insecurities relating to it when I was younger, it really used to bother me. I used to, felt like, I, I used to feel like I was gonna die alone as a kid and have oh, all these right. problems with it, and all these, yeah, straight into the deep end. Um, so that's kind of what swung me, into, swung me into the fitness and improving myself and wanting to be better and healthier. And then as a result of that, I think I've gained some, some form of mental, resilience and overcome that lack of confidence that I initially had through trial and error from that thing that I was diagnosed with very young. How did you find out that you had lymphedemia and sort of what mm -hmm. impact did that have on you as a kid? Um, I was about 13 years old, I think. And one day I just had a swollen leg out of nowhere uh, and it never, it never went away. So went to hospital. Um, I had some, I also couldn't walk at the time. I had some like pain in my knee and ankle. They didn't know what caused it. I went for tests over a series of months. And then eventually they finally diagnosed me with this condition. They told me it's one of these things that was never gonna get better. Um, it was it's meant to get worse as I get older. Yeah. Um, and at 13 years old, as like, it kind of sent me on my way, there wasn't really much support for it. And I was like, oh, brilliant, fantastic. And then to top it off as well, I had to wear a, uh, I still do, I've got it, got it on right now actually. I had to wear this uh, measly at the time. It was like a below knee compression garment on my leg, which looks like- hot. Yeah, <laughs> hot or hard? Yeah, well, just hot. I mean, like you're a 13 year old and you're like, 
I'm wearing a stocking. And not in a sexy stocking, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm wearing my Nana's half stocking <laughs> yeah. over my knee. It's not good. No, no, that, that, that well, it's funny you say that actually, because I, I used to be so insecure about oh. it. I, I'd go on family holidays, we'd go to Florida, and no matter how hot it got, I'd refuse to ever wear shorts. So I'd wear jeans everywhere, I'd be absolutely dying. Yeah. And, uh, and, and yeah, so I, I got diagnosed with this thing very young. Um, I had this below knee originally. I now wear a full, full length up to my groin. It's, it's literally, imagine a suspender. Yeah. It's a suspender on my leg 24 seven, basically. It's identical to a woman's There suspender. are some people that are very into that. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Find, find your tribe, eh? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> the internet is a niche finder. So as you can imagine, uh, 13 years old, being like around that age, you're very insecure about things anyway. You want to fit yeah. in. And it massively bothered me. It really, really affected me. Um, and then, and then from there, uh, I've had numerous issues with that. When you think it can't get, in the grand scheme of things, it isn't isn't that bad. But to you at the time, it's the worst thing in the world, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and then you think it can't get much worse. And I've had infections in my knee. Uh, I've had about nine surgeries. Um, and then progressively, it has got worse when I've had these issues come up. And I've just overcome it through fitness, health, and dealing with it. Basically, what do you suffer with when you have lymphedemia? Okay, so basically, what it is in my particular case or generally someone with lymphedema, they have yeah. a obstruction or damage to the, the lymphatic system. Okay. So it's like a, it's a one-way system that kind of flows back towards your, what, what do you call this? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're describing it perfectly. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wrong, you've okay. Said, right. Please do chop and correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. No, yeah. so there's three blood vessel systems. Yeah. There's your arteries that take blood away from your heart, mm -hmm. either to your lungs or your body. Yeah. There's the veins, that are the main ones that we know about that return them. Um, to our bodies that you can you know, see on the back of my hands and stuff. And then there's the lymph vessels, which return the very fine bits of cell fluid that all of our tissues are bathed in. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that very sort of, you know, uh, gentle, slow flow back towards our bodies. But because these things are have no muscle in them, they can't push themselves back. So your muscles, for example, squeeze and they're kind of kneading the fluid back. So if these vessels, like you said, are a bit buggered, mm. then the flow isn't going to happen. And so your leg sort of slightly swells because all this fluid can't get out of it. So it's kind of stuck. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, pretty much that. Um, but I'm, in my particular case, I'm missing all the lymphatic or lymph nodes around my kidneys on my left side and in my groin. So everything down from there doesn't drain very well at all, which makes wow. me prone to infection. Um, if I cut it, I can get infections very easily. Yeah. Uh, over time, you can get like a buildup of, you can get like, do you know the elephant man? You yeah. get like an elephant man type of leg or limb yeah. if it's not if it's not looked after, if it's not treated well. Um, and and yeah, a plethora of things. I struggle to stand up stationary. It's another one. Uh, it's because if I'm walking around, it's okay, like to a limit. Obviously the, the muscle pump action, the muscles assisting in pumping the lymphatic fluid back up to my body. But if I'm stood there stationary, conveniently enough, like in a queue or something, um, it can really begin to swell. It's quite painful. Um, there's other complications with it. Like I've got a cyst behind my leg, uh, which... It's painful if I bend down and other yeah. things, but yeah. It's weird because if you look at you, you look like a you know a physically fit young man, right? Yeah. That would never have to deal with this. But obviously, I can imagine being 13 with a swollen leg is not the dream. Mm. And the fact that actually it's caused you, you know, you've had seven surgeries on your knee. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. I've heard of basketball players that have had less injuries, you know, less problems. <laughs> Do you just mean so it's, it is actually a really impactful problem? Yeah. What about your self image? Like, you know, when you were looking at you with like one sausagey leg mm. versus a normal leg, and you're, you know, everyone else is kind of wandering around looking at, you know, girls, boys, or whoever. Yeah. How does it make you feel about your body? Yeah, I, I think any, anything that makes you different or you feel like makes you different, you feel like is a bad thing at the time. Like, I, I felt like it was one of the, the worst things that could possibly happen or I, I absolutely hated it like, i literally have this phobia on as young i was i convinced myself i was no one was ever gonna love me i was gonna die alone as a kid uh at pe or physical education i'd go into the disabled changing rooms to get changed i couldn't bear anyone to see my like this black leg i'd wear tracksuit bottoms through through uh pe etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah it did it did really bother me but I, I think i've come to realize as i've got older that everyone has has something be it physical or mental, that that is wrong with them. Uh, and it's just, when it's you, we are the center of our own universes, aren't we? We're very selfish creatures. When it's you, it's it's your problem. It's the biggest thing in the world. And so you've you've been dealing with this for a, a very long time and you've yeah. sort of taken the adversity on the chin and grown with it. And so what do you do day to day now? You're a content creator, you have your own YouTube channel, you're involved with fitness. Mm -hmm. So how is, you know, going through that, adversity and being on that journey led you to to do what you do today 
Oh, it's, it's an interesting one because since, since I got diagnosed with lymphedema at a very young age, I always knew that I could never have a conventional job. That if I, if I wasn't, I, I probably could have, but I told myself that if I wasn't my own boss, if I wasn't doing something on relatively on my terms where I could rest my leg or I could elevate my leg and put it up, um, I was going to be disabled by the time I was in my like 20s. Yeah. So I've always had that in the forefront of my mind growing up. So that's kind of dictated my career path because when I was like 15 years old, I used to do shitty jobs like uh, laboring work with yeah. my dad and things that were really strenuous and on your feet all day and the, the typical teenager, younger person jobs. Uh, I did, I was pot washing in a kitchen and yeah. it was like 40 degrees. And I remember doing that with lymphedema after after a hot summer's day and my leg was double in size. It was like grotesque. I could barely walk after it, making five pounds an hour. But I was like, I was like, shit, I need to do something that's not gonna cripple me and actually give me some kind of future because I can't, this isn't sustainable. So then I started uh, going down the route of I wanted to work in the film industry, actually. Um, I started to do that. I was like, oh, I had this idea to do underwater filmmaking and work on like BBC documentaries and I was into my diving and other things. Yeah. I was like, okay, the only thing that's good for my leg is swimming, is diving, uh, swimming, diving, same difference. So uh, I had this idea to, to go and do that. And then I started, I studied marine biology at university. Uh, whilst I was doing that at university, I'd also do commercial diving work. So like scallop, uh, scallop diving. Yeah, yeah. And then I'd work on films as well in my time off. So I was doing all these things to try and build this career set to, uh, to get to this end goal of doing this thing in the film industry that would allow me to, but I'd enjoy and allow me to live a normal life. Yeah. So I did, I did start to do all these things. I think I got this big, I got my first big film job that was on a, a series by Kurt Sutter, who also did Sons of Anarchy. Okay. Um, who, it wasn't Sons of Anarchy, it was something similar. It's an absolute flop. It's a Netflix thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. Hell, you got to Netflix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Give yourself one of these, mate. Getting yeah. to Netflix is no joke. But I remember, I remember doing that and finally getting to this pinnacle point where I was like, yes, I'm getting somewhere. It's like kind of looking up. And after a day's work, uh, if, if you've ever like seen anything or done anything in film, it's relentless, like 14 hours on your feet. My first day doing that, I was crippled. Like, I couldn't, I, I was absolutely in a bad way. And I remember just going home from that and just crying because I was like, my life is over, it's done. There's nothing I can do that's gonna prevent me from getting to this place, like, or allow me to, to live a relatively normal, successful life, if that makes sense. And then, and then from there, fortunately, I also started to get into fitness. Um, I had surgery when I was probably about 20 at this point. But when I was 17, 18, I was hospitalized quite badly. I got down to about 60 kilograms in weight. Oh, wow. um, I had an infection in my leg, uh, needed several surgeries. I uh, was in hospital for a good few weeks. Uh, I can't remember how long exactly. And uh, so I started training in order to be able to get better from that because Doctors being the optimists that they are, they told me that I was going to suffer from arthritis in my knee and I damage to the cartilage. I probably wasn't going to be able to run very well and all this stuff. So your life's ruined <laughs> yeah. now. Welcome yeah. to the next 60 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so out of pure spite and ego, I think, as a man, I was like, absolutely not. I'm going to ignore that advice and uh, try and get as better as possible. So I was on this mission to, to be able to do all these things again and not be permanently maimed by the surgeries and the infection that I had. And eventually I got, got fit, got into good shape, kept going, um, yeah. started to do bodybuilding, other things. And then as I was doing that in the film stuff, I kind of developed the skill set whilst I was filming and doing all this other stuff and merged the two together, uh, made a video about, or started documenting my training, my journey on social mm. media, um, overcoming surgeries and other things, and then took off, did well from there and fell into coaching online, coaching men, um, YouTube, social media stuff. Yeah. It's pretty much it. Yeah. And as they say, the rest is history. Rest is history. Yeah. Amazing. And Dr. Anand, thank you so much for being nice. here. I'm going to ask you a similar sort of question. Sure. You know, how did you become and what was your journey like, you know, qualifying as a doctor and then specializing in sexual health, fertility and sexual function? So I think most of it's quite random because I was seven and my dad said, you're going to be a doctor. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and it's that normal thing, I think, of immigrant parents yeah. where kind of you want to jump up a few social strata. But, uh, you know, I, I, th I think it you know, stood in good stead. I obviously went to university. Um, but actually, uh, kind of medicine wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a school teacher, but that wasn't the dream um, for my parents. I did that um, and really enjoyed it. But about three years in, I got kind of a very sort of miserable doing a couple of really... Uh, 
upsetting basically jobs they they were rather depressing because i worked on a, a couple of units where i only saw inpatients and generally the inpatients were those that were just dying mm. uh and so uh, it, it just meant i got depressed really uh so uh, i i i uh, started training doctors to become um gps uh, alongside the gp work and one of the first training sessions we had was something called psychosexual medicine and i'd never heard about this and at university, we, ne we never really get trained about anything. We, I think there was one lecture for half an hour on erectile problems, but no, no nothing else, very little on fertility. Mm. Um, and you know, we had a three hour session by this incredible woman called Victoria Lehman, who's a friend of mine still. And she just basically talked about, right, Viagra, Cialis, squeezing it in, ramming it in, um, <laughs> or you know, good enough relationships, yeah. you know, because actually it doesn't have to be perfect every time. Um, what to do if basically your vagina's a bit dry, what to do if you kind of, you know. If, if you're she sounds amazing, yourself. by she the way. She was amazing. <laughs> and so I was like, what? This is amazing. So I did my European training and European exams in sexual function mm. and uh basically got hooked so now i now do men's health testosterone deficiency and then got into fertility because got to do a lovely tv show with um uh, russell kane and ollie lock and melvin o'doom uh with this amazing um fertility doctor called uh, uh called jonathan ramsey who's basically the king of balls apparently <laughs> uh and and you know he just is so inspiring about men's fertility and there's loads of crossover with testosterone um, and fertility so it was just like a natural progression absolutely love i feel very lucky to be in the situation i'm in i'm just doing jobs that i find really enjoyable so some, something we love to do here at the men's manual is take a little look at some stats to set a bit of context for the the issues that we're going to be discussing and i've got some on my notes here i'll pull up my laptop and these are some stats that the team here at manual have pulled together they're just kind of put some of the issues that we're going to be talking about right at the front of our mind. So according to the Massachusetts Male Aging Study, 52% of men will experience ED in some form throughout their life, which I think is a crazy stat. And also figures published in the, by the UK Health Security Agency showed there are 392,453 sexually transmitted infections reported in England in 2022 alone. That's a 24% rise on the previous year. Another amazing stat is a survey carried out by Prostate Cancer UK found that more than half of the 2,000 men in the study didn't know where their prostate was. 17% didn't know they had one, weird, <laughs> and, <laughs> and only 8% knew what it did. And the last one, which we're going to talk about, is premature ejaculation. This is the most common male sexual problem impacting men of all ages, but predominantly younger men. And this is according to the health.gov.au health topics, sexual health. Okay, so what we're going to run through there is ED, STIs, prostate, and premature ejaculation. So a lot of... Really interesting Sounds topic. Sounds like Tuesday morning. Yeah, <laughs> Tuesday morning for Dr. Annan. So I mean, that numbers, those come sound completely normal. And when I'm talking to my patients about erectile dysfunction, if we start with that, I'm like 40% at 40 and 70% at 70 may have erectile problems. Mm. And if you're younger, it may well be more psychological, might be some performance anxiety. It might be a bit of stress or something like that. But as you get older, the blood vessels to your willy, which are the narrowest in the human body, fur up first. So actually, if they're getting narrow and narrow, so they're, you know, they're, they're a millimeter in diameter, sometimes smaller. So if that, if that gets furred up with cholesterol because mm. of your eating or because of stress or poor sleep or whatever, um, it means that just like any tube, it gets blocked and your penis doesn't fill. I mean, your, your penis is an extension of your heart and blood vessels. So if your heart's not pumping properly and those blood vessels aren't open, how's your willy going to fill up? Is that the primary cause of age-related erectile dysfunction? Yeah. I, thought, I would have thought it was testosterone. No, because wow, actually most people will get to 80 and have a normal testosterone. Yeah. It's four in 10 people over 45 will have a low testosterone. So 60% okay. have a normal testosterone. Yeah. And it will be enough for them to have a sex life. It will be enough for them to have sexual interest and all of these things, mm -hmm. retain a decent muscle mass. But there's that 40%. Um, and as, you know, as we get to 2045, half of all men will be 45 and above. Yeah. So that's up to 7 million men may have a low testosterone. You know, our sperm counts are half of what they used to be 50 years ago. Mm. So if that's the case, why? 
What, what do you think it's related to? Probably environment. In anything in particular? Uh, I, so I think food. a lot of the foods that we, the, the quality of the food that we're eating is more yeah. processed. My diet's dreadful. I talk a good talk about what you should be eating. And I'm sat there with like, you know, chips mm. covered in salt. <laughs> so, and I'm vegetarian. I, I just, I eat terribly. So don't listen to what I eat, but I do have the right advice about it. And because, you know, I'm 47 now, as I've got older, I've had to listen going, oh, hang on. You can't just talk about this. You do have to do this. And I, obviously you guys working in fitness, I, I walked in and these two just looked like kind of Greek gods. And I'm sat there going, I kind of look like a tall Ewok. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, shit, keep your clothes on. Um, Far too nice. <laughs> well, we, 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 that, <laughs> I was going, thank you for that. Was, uh, <laughs> we were going to try and do this podcast. We, we were toying with the idea mm. of doing this podcast naked. We talked about it earlier. And we think maybe if we get enough interaction in the comments section, We'll do a reshoot and it'll be uh, in the buff. So people, don't worry, that won't be me. <laughs> <laughs> There's not enough money in that contract. <laughs> so let's let's rewind a little bit about erectile dysfunction. Um, clinically, what is it? And anecdotally, what happens? Is that just people can't or, or men can't get an erection or sustain an erection? So we'll start with how you get an erection, right? Yeah. So it's basically visual information. So men tend to be quite visual, a bit of you know, something you like the look of. Yeah. You know, I don't know, Pamela Anderson or even uh, David Hasselhoff, I mean, depending yeah. on your point of view, right? So, <laughs> so whatever comes in, uh, catches your interest, goes to the back of your brain, stimulates your uh, arousal centers in the brain, then sends information down your spinal cord to your erection centers, uh, which then sends blood uh, to your penis and hopefully get an erection. Same with women, they get vulval swelling um, and flooding of, the, of their erectile tissue. Um, however, um, over time, the uh, the information going down your spinal cord, it's like the, the quality degrades. Okay. It's like the signal isn't so strong and that can be because you've got diabetes because unfortunately the higher sugar levels in diabetes actually damage the nerves. Mm -hmm. So the nerves themselves aren't sending enough information and so the strength of the erection can fall. And you know, you kind of need enough blood pumping into that willy to oh, keep yeah. it hard. Oh, that's so you're more prone to erectile dysfunction if you've got diabetes. Yes, oh, that's so interesting. You'll get it 15 years to... earlier. Okay. If you've got if you've got diabetes, you get erectile problems 15 years earlier. You get no heart way. complications 15 years earlier. Yeah. It also damages the lining of blood vessels. Mm. And so if these blood vessel linings are damaged, they get increasingly furred up with fat and cholesterol deposits. Mm -hmm. So the the tube gets narrower and narrower and narrower. Can't deliver the speed of blood flow. So it's it's a mixture between nerve. Fat, function and blood vessel function okay and if you don't have both firing well then you don't get an erection oh. so if you're thinking about uh, obviously uh, we are sat here in a in a social stroke work environment mm -hmm. we have learned over time that we socially um suppress erections because <laughs> it's not appropriate for me that's, to what, you, that's what you think <laughs> why do you think i'm sat like this <laughs> yeah. I, I did wonder why sean was stroking but I guess that's one so um, so the idea is that we suppress it and we suppress it using our sympathetic nervous systems. However, if people take a, a line of coke or something mm -hmm. that hyperstimulates your sympathetic system. So despite the fact you're really aroused up here, you'll suppress any erection. Mm -hmm. But the same thing happens if you're worried. Again, your adrenaline mm -hmm. goes up, all the negative stuff, because literally it's very evolutionary. If you have the chance of a saber tooth tiger ripping your hamstrings out, you're not going to want to get an erection. You want no. to make your penis as small as possible, like a chicken nugget, and your testicle is going to hoik <laughs> up into your body because you're going to make your genitals as small as possible so in a fight it doesn't get ripped off. Mm -hmm. So it's to protect you from these processes. The problem is that doesn't help you if you're anxious. And you know this person's really hot and you really fancy them and you're on a first date, but you've got a really like a chicken nugget because you are actively suppressing that. Mm. You're actually, so you need to be chilled out to mm. allow that system to switch off and your parasympathetic to take over. So it then gets flooded with blood and you're like, ah, oh, I'm in the moment. I'm engaged with this person. I'm not worried about family. I'm not worried about the shopping. I'm not worried about the dog scrabbing at the door. I'm not worried about the kids crying or whatever might be the thing that's taking up space in your brain instead of focusing on your genitals. But as you get older, you need to focus more on genital stimulation because visual doesn't cut it. Because that information highway is getting more and more blocked up and functioning less well. So as you get older, what you need to do is get basically more mutual masturbation or more oral sex. So you need someone to fluff you because that will work via a spinal reflex where the information goes straight to your spinal cord and straight back out. It doesn't need to go to the brain. It bypasses it. Okay. So basically a hand job can keep you going um, if, if visual information isn't quite as it should be.
I'm going to write this down. This is, and this is, this is doc, doctor says. <laughs> this is, yeah. <laughs> doctor says, hand jobs are the for best. Everyone. Hand jobs for everybody. <laughs> I feel like Oprah, you have a hand job. You have a hand job. <laughs> so I think we can all agree that hand jobs for everyone is a big win. But obviously that's got a lot to do with blood flow and arousal and fluid movement throughout the body. Obviously, Mo, with you and your lymphedemia, did you ever sort of experience issues, you know, related to your condition, which affected your, you know, sexual performance, yeah. sexual confidence, that sort of stuff? Yeah, definitely. I think every, I think every, every young man goes through the journey of uh, busting a nut in one second, the technical term, <laughs> uh, those, those kind of things. Um, but, but in my specific case, yeah, I used to, obviously I used to be very insecure about the, the leg, about having to wear yeah. the black leg tight. Uh, and, and I remember when I got my first proper girlfriend, so I feel like I'm bringing this conversation down. You bring it up and I bring it down to some depressing no, level honestly, every time. Though the reality of the thing is so much more interesting that, okay, yeah, this is the science, but actually what does it mean to people? Yeah. So this is the reality. No, go ahead. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. But, but the, so, so uh, when I got my first girlfriend uh, and I had all these problems, the crippling insecurities of my leg, I uh, absolutely hated the, the way that I looked. I remember that I couldn't actually get changed in front of her in my own room. So I'd have to go, if she came around uh, and we were going to have sex or anything along those lines, I'd have to go into the bathroom first, take off my black leg suspender, and then go back in and then after that, put it back on and like try and hide it. Mm. And it really, really, this really bothered me. So it's incredibly awkward, as you can imagine, like trying to set a mood with someone. And then, oh, one minute, I've just got to oh, go, go to the toilet and take off this yeah. uh, this black leg suspender. So, so that, that was a, a big one that really bothered me growing up, I think. That was the first proper issue in terms of relationships that I had mm. with it. And also, I suppose it's always, if, if you have that insecurity and you're, that, the thing that's nibbling away at your self-esteem, it's always going to be there in the back of your mind. So when you're, you know, as we spoke about earlier, when the signals from your brain are being shuttled to, mm. to make you hard and, and ready for action, you've probably got this thing distracting you and taking away those nerve impulses right is that is that how it works totally exactly right I mean, it just basically you reduce your pleasure because you're so focused on you're focused on yourself but in the wrong way mm -hmm. you're focused on the problem that you might be causing or the way that you think the other person might be thinking of you yeah. Like, oh, do you know what I mean? Oh, I look, maybe I look a bit fat hunched over and what's happening to my nipple and my moob. And yeah, yeah. All this, you don't, clearly both don't have those problems, but I certainly <laughs> do. Um, and, and the issue is if you're busy thinking about how you're perceived or you're busy thinking about that, you are not actually enjoying the sexual moment. Mm. You're not enjoying their touch. You're not enjoying um, you know, the fun of sliding in and out or you know what they're doing at the moment or where they're tickling or where they're probing. That is actually hugely stimulating, hugely fun if you're allowed to feel it and if you allow yourself to feel it. And having, as you say, this kind of voice in the back of your head going, you're not good enough. You're not hot enough. You know, you've got a funny leg. You know, all of this in your head going, what if she sees my stocking? You know, I, I can get that would kind of make me go, fuck, I don't want to take my clothes off if that's going to, how mm. I'm going to feel about it. Mm. But I think it's absolutely fine to be anxious and nervous about it. But if you recognize that's the case, then try and do something about it. Go and speak to someone if it's something you can't get out of the cycle yourself. It's so complicated. And there's so much stuff you're meant to worry about these days. Like, you know, when I was a kid, there wasn't Instagram. I got my first phone at 24. But like, you know, you've got people that look up to you that, you know, that, that you have to almost present for. And I find that really challenging in terms of if a young person is watching that then do I have to be like that? Do mm. I have to have muscles like them? Do I have to look like that, you know, that girl over off, off um, uh, Love Island? You know, I've got much smaller chest or I've got a bigger bottom or something like that. that. And if that's sat in your head chirping away, telling you you're not good enough, how are you going to enjoy the sex with the person you're with? I think that's a really interesting way of framing it. And I think what we consume and what we view online has such an impact, not only for, for the, the, the young people that are in that formative stage of forming their own identities, but even for, for us as adults, I think what we consume drastically impacts our being. And I know that you've spoken a lot about pornography and how mm -hmm. that can impact um, people's identity and their well-being and their sense of being. Do you, want to, do you want to dig into that a little bit more from your point of view? Uh, I've made some YouTube content on pornography and how I don't think it's necessarily a good thing per se with mm. the, the increase in people watching porn at a younger age how it changes your brain how it you're constantly seeking that novelty that new thing and it's kind yeah. of this never never ending spiral of looking for new satisfaction 
in, in the same way as a, a drug addict doing some cocaine, you know, it's like you're chasing this thing, you're chasing this high. And then when you get it, you want the next thing. Looking at the, the science behind it. So when, so say when a man sits down and, you know, their wife goes out and quickly pants her down up straight on, straight online. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what is going on with the body? Like what's happening with the hormones? Like, so it, it, you start with any sort of, of, of seeking. So, yeah. if, uh, so you, the hormone that you get released if you, and, and you get uh, kind of extra bonus points for really is when you release dopamine and chase dopamine. So uh, it's the hunter gatherer thing. So if you are looking or searching for something fantastic and your body rewards nothing more than trying to pass on your genes. You know, getting your end away is got a really, really highly innovated part of your brain. So if you're seeking sex, whatever that is, if that's solo sex, if that's sex with another partner or whatever, your brain's very much up for it. Right. So dopamine's released and that's humming away. So you're kind of like, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. However, once you actually get, you know, for, say for example, you come, you get the opiate release in the brain. So opiates are basically like, almost like heroin. So there's that sense of peace pleasure, relaxation, you know, and you also get oxytocin coming out. Oxytocin is kind of the cuddle drug. Mm. Um, but if you're the person stroking yourself, it's not going to be releasing oxytocin in the same level that you're going to get if someone else is giving you touch yeah. and sensation. So there is a different reaction between relationship sex, not necessarily, you know, it can be a relationship lasting five minutes. Or what I mean is like, you know, the partnered sex and sex on your own. Yeah. You know, if your relationship is with your laptop, that's kind of how you're coding <laughs> what sex is. And then you go, you know, you've been watching, I don't know, if you're edging to seven or eight different videos, you know, you're, you're masturbating to a series of three to five minute videos, one after the other. Mm. And each one is, you know, uh, highly arousing because like porn is designed to get noise. People aren't watching the porn, they're fapping away. You know, everyone goes, <laughs> oh, I was watching a bit of porn. No, you weren't. You had your hand around your cock and you were fapping away. <laughs> that's what you were doing, right? Yeah. And that's fine. We're using a nice euphemism to cover up the fact that no one wants to talk about wanking to porn. But you're having you're doing a sex act which is probably not helpful if it's one of your mainstays of sexual interest. And if it's all you've done, say from the age of 12 to through 15, 20, and that's how your body has learnt what sex means to you and coded that for you, you then try and have sex with a person. And your mm. brain's like, they smell a bit, or they smell of them, or they feel different to my hand. Or, yeah, and, 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 and let's be honest, no one's mouth, anus, or vagina is going to be anywhere tight as your firmly gripped, unlooped <laughs> hand. We call it death grip. And you're like, if you're just grinding yourself to a, to a toothpick because you've not bothered to use lube, how, is, how has anyone's orifice yeah, yeah, yeah. going to squeeze you in the same way. So how is your brain going to recognize that's pleasurable? Uh, I think it's, it's the path of least resistance as well, isn't it? Especially if you're younger, it's much easier when you're not confident, when you don't want to get rejected, to go out and, or, well, not to go out, <laughs> to, to sit on a computer, get some porn up and ejaculate several times. Absolutely. I completely yeah. get you date of five fingers because that's who's there, right? Yeah. It's the most loving relationship I've ever had. But if that's what you if if that's what becomes your normal, then that can be really problematic. And you can see some men in sex. Some men that come see me at quite a young age, they're trying to have sex, but they can't necessarily ejaculate inside. As they get older, they often find they can't actually stay hard inside, mm. and that's because often they've coded themselves to the dry palm. So I'd always say, if you are masturbating, use lubricant, because actually that's going to slightly more mirror sexual activity. And if you want to use a penile sleeve like a flashlight, all other versions Wait. available, but like stick it between a pillow and fuck it. You think that'd be better than way using better your hand? Than, way better than using your hand. Like you've got a, a basically a portable vagina or mouth or anus in a can. You stick it between some pillows and actually thrust, which is the motion you're probably going to want to replicate in later life. So actually, if you're doing the thing, it's kind of like going to the gym. Like you, repli you do your reps in the way that you'd hopefully like to achieve the movement you need to do the job you do. In a case where you're not considering someone that suffers from premature ejaculation, yeah. I would have thought that using something like a, a penile sleeve would create a problem though, because it's more pleasurable. So if you've, the, the, these sleeves are made of silicone and they're, they're sort of flesh-like yeah. feel. Um, but the inside, unfortunately, well, not fortunately, has got uh, sort of ribs and, and little nobbles and yeah. things to increasingly stimulate you. You can buy a more basic sleeve that doesn't have those. Mm. So what I'd probably go for is making sure you've got an unribbed sleeve, which is a more natural feel. 
Um, so it doesn't feel internally like someone's literally trying to jack you off. Um, and then you would use lubricant with it because hopefully the person you were with would be lubricated either naturally if it's a vagina or um, with lube if you're going somewhere else. Um, and then you just have a go. Okay. Enjoy. Interesting. Do you, do you think it would encourage people to <laughs> masturbate and watch porn though? That's that. That's what I think. So, I mean, if you if the issue is it's quite distracting trying to have to hump yeah. whilst watching something. Because I imagine the laptop's bouncing about if it's on the bed. Or, <laughs> I'm sure it can be done. <laughs> I'm sure you can get like a Where there's a will, right. there's a way, guys. <laughs> there's Where a there's, there's a will, a there's a way. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure you can d- do it like that. I've seen the, uh, you can get an iPad case that has one built in. I've seen adverts of those. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's got like a flashlight built into an iPad case. I definitely don't own one, and I don't actually own one of these. So the, the, but... the, the innovative ability of a man that wants a wank, honestly, yeah. is incredible. Isn't yeah. it? So my next question would be, do you think that or men that are wanking a lot, that that's a positive step in terms of their development and maybe the impact it has on future relationships? Or do you think it's something that might be holding them back? I feel as if you're 14 or 15, unless you have access to a regular partner, you're going to be masturbating probably quite a lot. I, I'm more talking about, I think, I think you know, between the ages of 13 and 18, yeah. you know, the, the heavy sway is going to be self-love. But potentially when you start to have more serious relationships, do you think that if you continue to wank three times a day, that, that would have an impact on those relationships? I mean, I, I think so professionally, absolutely. I mean, it's not like you've got, well, it maybe it is like you've got so many in a day. Yeah, yeah, you know, there yeah. are only so many times you can have sex, right? Yeah. And so if you've had solo sex, that's potentially going to reduce your drive and interest with your partner. So I think if you are masturbating sit three times a day and then expecting to then go and have sex three times in that night, mm. I think you're probably unlikely to do so and certainly people who get from their 20s 30s because these are the people i'm really seeing at the moment men in their 20s and 30s who've been you know having sex three times a day twice a day and then all of a sudden they notice it takes me two or three days and actually i feel pretty knackered in between i don't want to have sex and then we try and have sex and i can't get my erection quite as well so but you know and they're they're horrified about this and i'm like well part of this is natural because you know when you were 15 16 Yes, you went to school, but you didn't really have a job. You didn't have to worry specifically. Well, most people hope you don't have to worry about money or where the food's coming yeah. from or paying for the you know the kids' feeds or whatever. The stresses and strains weren't at the same level. They may have been different. I appreciate they may not say the same level, but that I think really means the pressure is different. Also, the expectation of what a healthy sex life looks like after you've gone for a meal and you've had a few drinks and you've been exercising in the morning and you had a stressful day and you're expected to then hop on and have mm. sex. You're like, really? You know, where is this time for social engagement? Because people stop flirting. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. I've been in a relationship for 15 years now. And I don't be honest, I can't remember the last time I sent this like a flirty text. I mean, it used to be, right, get your pants off. And now it's kind of like, is the pizza in the oven? And that's not a euphemism. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I yeah. think we get less good at that because we become more like an arger as we get older. And it's more like, oh, God, how middle class. Enough. Anyway, you know, like you kind of, you've got to keep the oven on all day. Yeah. You've got to be warming up it up all day to kind of like uh, perform in the evening. And if you're first dating, you're often sending flirty little things to each other, thinking about you. And it doesn't have to be a pick of your hole. It can just be like, you're just like, I'm th- <laughs> thinking about certain people. Yeah. Um, I'm saying, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about you. I, you know, you looked really hot last night. Mm. You know, it, it's been, you, you were so great with our kid. Because mm. actually, even those things that are non-sexual, if you think more positively about the other person, that's really great for your relationship. And there's some evidence that doing something non-sexual with your partner that's new, because you mentioned newness before, mm-hmm. are chasing you. But actually, you need that to maintain the passion in a long-term relationship. So if you see, um, if you do something, I don't know, pottery class with your partner, because it's new, your brain will think, oh, that was cool. I saw them in that environment. That makes me think them in a slightly new light. So, you see them at work and they've done a cool presentation or something, or you see a bit of art that they did and you're like, okay, I see you. Aren't you cool? I, 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 and, and in thinking they're cool, you then go, well, I'm quite cool because I've got you. And so there's some kind of self-referential building up that goes on. I suppose pe- people do get comfortable and in a relationship and then you know you get into your routines and as you said, stress is built up. So I think... Mixing it up in terms of what you're doing definitely helps keep 
mm. you know, the chemistry fresh and probably the biochemistry fresh, yeah, totally. right? Totally. The dopamine, because the dopamine falls once you've been in an established relationship. It's due to novelty. Exactly. So, okay. Because you're having to, ha having to, in those commas, have sex with the same person or people. You may have secondary or tertiary relationships. But like if you're having to have sex with the same person, the dopamine levels are going to fall. But your oxytocin levels, which promote trust and closeness, are going to go up. Yeah. So you're hoping the point at which dopamine comes down enough for you to get that reality check. I think all of us know friends that would break up with their partners every three months. Or they've been going out for six months and then they break up with them. That's when your dopamine level has fallen enough that you're like, it's not that exciting anymore. And that's because your lustful limerence period is over and you're moving into compassionate love. Mm -hmm. Now, to keep that stuff fresh, you do fresh stuff. But mm. most people kind of get into that comfortable, let's eat pizzas and get a bit fatter together, which I'm totally here with. I was, <laughs> I've was i got on 10 kilos um, since we started going out. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it's about not neglecting each other. So I think that the place and prominence of relationships is right up there with what we're talking about and the importance of the relationship and the sexual interaction between a couple or more, as you've highlighted. <laughs> um, Mo, going back to you, and obviously yeah. you said that what, you know, with the lymphedema uh -huh. and, and the impact that that had on how you formed relationships and how confident you were in relationships. Yeah. Obviously, as you've grown and, and become better at dealing with your issues how's that transferred and impacted your relationships so it, it impacted very negatively to begin with i feel like now it's something that's something positive has fruited from if that makes sense so i was i was very lucky not to suffer from erectile dysfunction or i wasn't ever that concerned about my image or it just for some reason didn't affect in that way maybe the the holiness of being a 14 15 16 year old lad <laughs> overcame all those insecurities that i had um but yes I was, I was very lucky lucky on on that front but i'd say for me the biggest thing that's that that maybe fully get over it is i'm gonna have to swear in this you can you can swear Fantastic. as much or as little is, as you is, like is now i just fuck with a black suspender on my leg i don't okay. even bother taking it off i don't care i'm like by the way i've got a uh like i've got a black suspender on my leg it's what i like it turns me on it rouses me i just Leave it at that. I've got one for you. Yeah, literally, yeah. <laughs> I won't even say anything. So I feel like what, whatever that is taught me that whatever the thing that you're bothered about is, other people aren't ultimately going to be that bothered about it as you are. It's like kind of in your head. And then if you're in that situation where this thing scares you that you're incredibly insecure about and you just go into it head first. Like for example, maybe you don't like your hair. Maybe yeah. you're, you, you wear a hat all the time and you don't want your partner to see your awful hairline uh, a lot of an issue, an issue. <laughs> you're laughing at me. i've not had a hairline since i was 15 so i'm not well, well yeah you, you, you're, you're immune to this so uh, fantastic but not when i was 14 but, but, but yeah <laughs> but, but, then, but then, then i'd say just just go go straight into the deep end and, and give it a, give it a go with that insecurity at the forefront it will probably find out if you can get an erection and it isn't some crippling thing that it isn't actually actually that bad and that that's helped me out massively and that's probably the biggest thing that i say to other people going through a similar thing or especially the younger lads as well where there's things you might not be happy about your weight you might not be happy about the the way that you look etc etc it's like this person is with you because they find you attractive ultimately mm -hmm. it's only you that is bothered by it but on the, on the, on the flip side it's kind of changing it it's, um i did at the minute though i do because i'm getting so lean i do have no testosterone pretty much whatsoever so an erection is a, a fleeting thing for me at the moment which is quite an interesting one so i'm on the other end of the spectrum rather than uh no, actually no it's the same end of the spectrum isn't it um but probably biologically it's slightly different the cause behind it well you, perhaps you're in a stress state aren't you yeah well, and if you're in a stress because you're lean and you're the, the calories yeah. internally are not mm -hmm. enough and you're training very high level yeah yeah it may just be that actually your brain is evolutionary wise you're not in a fit state yeah, to get right. pregnant. It's like you know, uh, uh, women gymnasts, because whilst they've got really good muscle strength, mm. they've generally got low fat mass, and so often they stop having their periods. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a thing with men's physique capacity. I've got six weeks until my bodybuilding show, men's physique show, and it's like in this kind of period, uh, you've competed, haven't you? I have lots. You're probably aware yeah. of this. You get to a stage where downstairs just stops working because you get really? so... Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. Or it's inevitable with all, all men, all competitors, really. Um, 
Okay. I'm just a bit, sorry, I've, I've just not, I mean, you know, people that come to see me are generally not. It's very not niche, isn't it? Bill. Well, no, they're not generally bodybuilders who are active. They're generally people who've used performance enhancing drugs okay. during mm. their, their workouts and things. And they come to me afterwards when yeah. the fertility is a bit shot yeah. or they've got low testosterone and they require replacement. Yeah. So it's fascinating to hear it at this stage. But no, I, th- I think it's linked to uh, a, a natural fall in testosterone mm. due to being so lean and body fat. So yeah, I've started to get to that say, stage uh, but is it, around is it, now. It, it's also one of those ones where because you're in that extreme caloric deficit, you're also training, you're also probably stressed about it. You know, it's those additional stresses that are physiologically yeah. on your body cool. that so, do. Uh, but also, it, you know, having sex is probably the last thing you want to do because you're so goddamn tired. Yeah. Right? You're so tired all the time because you're training so hard. You're not giving yourself enough food because you're in that caloric deficit. But also chances are, you're focused on one thing and you're really bloody minded and single minded towards that and everything else is a distraction. Yeah. And, and that and that's hard to take for a for a partner. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I'm you're like actually for six months or however long we're just not really gonna be intimate. And you're like, uh, I don't think that's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, is it ever a discussion? I mean, I don't know if you're with someone currently, but yeah. is it like a discussion? You kinda of go, look, I'm gonna now be training for this. I'm not gonna want you. I I, in, so I have, a, I have a girlfriend, uh, I've been with her for about three years. So I, I've done a few shows before and I'm aware that your sex drive goes and we, we still have, we have a very good sex, we have a good mm-hmm. sex life. Mm-hmm. She enjoys having sex with me, I hope. Uh, so before <laughs> I embarked- It's all right, I've seen your report card. It's yeah, fine. yeah. I, I hope so anyway. B minus, but that's not bad. <laughs> yeah, I do, I do my best. A solid three out of 10 effort most of the time. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I did pre warner before. That I was like, look, I'm going to do this. This is going to happen. I'm going to be very tired. My, right. my sex drive is going to go down. So, and, and she's like, obviously the element of, oh, as long as I know it's not because you're not attracted to me anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, as long as I know it's, it's because of you rather than me, uh, in, in a sense. That's the. But that's totally thing. right, isn't it? It's like actually you were communicating yeah. that there might be an issue because of this. It's nothing to do with you. Yeah. So, I mean, I appreciate that some people wouldn't believe that because mm-hmm. of their own issues or hang-ups that they actually believe no no it is about me but you just got told it wasn't yeah what happens for example if you're going to head towards wanting kids and stuff are you going to continue so, the cycle there's no there's no long-term effects on fertility in oh. men as far as i'm aware of uh getting to very low body fat so i'm not gonna it's unsustainable getting how lean i am now i've lost about eight kilograms um, I'm, I'm freezing cold all the time um, I was going for a walk the other night and I was like trying to pick my feet up. I was almost hallucinating. I was so tired. So you're, you're effectively starving yourself and it's, it's not sustainable to do longer term. It's this weird boy beauty pageant thing. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just listening going, oh my God. So it, it, it just feels terrifying. Like, you know, the, the, the best thing about me is my six pack on this day or mm-hmm. whatever, my lats or whatever. Yeah. Muscle that we're going to be talking about that you're particularly proud of. Uh, and then the rest of the time it's looking in the mirror going, oh, I was good. I'm not there again, or I need to achieve greater mm. Adonishood. Adonishood, I, mean, I like that. I think, I think for somebody like Mo, it's probably one of those ones where you've you've come from such a place of uh, sort of compromised physical health, mm. right? With your with your condition, and you've really set yourself a challenge of this is where I want to be. This for me is the optimum place of me peaking physically. Yeah, and you've kind of charted your own journey, and you've made your own. You know, you you going on your own transformative journey. So I can really see the impact that that could have on your identity and and what it means to you. But I think for a lot of people that are always just striving for that kind of next hit and that whether it's external adulation or whether it's internal insecurity that they're trying to live up to something, I think it's one of those things that if it's something you choose to do, it's something you need to be really, really aware of as well. I I think there's, yeah, there's definitely different reasons for doing it. Mm. And the, I'm sure you are probably similar as well. I've done a few shows previously to this. And I think on the one side that there's, there's this thing to be the best and this like ego driven, like narcissistic thing where you want to look your best and be the best and, and yada, 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 which is why a lot of people do do it. But then I think as you get a bit older, you, you kind of grow out of that a little bit. Yeah. So for me in my particular instance now, I'm not saying I was immune to it because in the past that was the reason that I was, I was doing it because I wanted to like prove I was wrong and this like hyper masculine. Uh. But for, for me now, it's about the actual, the, the process of a journey of doing it, having something that, having so, a, a clear outcome at the end of something. So being on a journey from A to B, this like hero's path where I've embarked on this thing that's going to be shit. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be difficult. And then it's the process of 
building that discipline, starving myself, which it's probably not going to be the healthiest thing. And you're going to be like, I'm just listening to all this. Going, Why do you need to do this What's to wrong yourself? With these people? Okay. Well, given you guys are quite so competitive, here's what I prepared earlier. Oh, wow. So we're doing competitive anatomy, but it's you know not the bits that you're showing on stage. We're looking at your bits and pieces. So the idea is to see if you know your body. Boys. Yeah. What is E? I know what that is. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, yeah fine. That's What's the it? acorn. Fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that depends if you've been taking performing art enhancing drugs or not. Uh, uh, and the thing cupping the acorn, cupping the testicle. Yeah. What's that? It's when you're checking it for nodules and... Oh, what are you talking about? The So, so what's the bit that's coming? Oh. What's the bit there? The C shape. The hand holding the ball. No. Is it, uh, the testicular Is it called... Is it called ves vesicles? No. No. Okay. No. I mean, what's, no. What I find this interesting just because obviously most men have them. Yeah, but yeah. actually men, and men will spend a lot of time probably on their willy. Yeah. They spend very little time sometimes on their undercarriage okay. and on the balls hanging out of them, right? So you've got the balls there. What are the jobs of your balls? Produce testosterone. Yeah. Sperm. And sperm. Yeah, literally two jobs. That's all they've got to do. But you've got this match, sort of basically a maturating factory system where you basically make the sperm and then they get stored back here and then they get fired out in this tube. And what's that tube there? Is that your urethra? No. Damn it. Well, I mean, it becomes It the becomes urethra. your urethra. It becomes okay. the urethra eventually. Yeah, <laughs> Very good. So no, we have a half a point. Half a point. Half Mo, a point. Anyone for you? No, I can't remember. This is going to be... Okay. So basically it gets stored in there, stored in there. And obviously when it's ready to come out. Um, so basically when you're having sex, this part of your body stores your, your sperm. So what's that there? So that is... Um, uh, this is B. B. I, 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 I'm... I think it's the wrong place. But I, I was going to say prostate, but it's... Here's your prostate. Oh, it's oh, a prostate. Good, yeah. Yeah, good. So this is your bladder. Yeah. And in Greek, prostate means that which stands before. So it's the uh, okay. bit that sits in front of your bladder. Yeah. So it's basically this, this ball there. How big is it? Uh, about the size of an acorn? No. Bigger than F that. 50p piece. Bigger. So it's basically the size of a walnut stroke chestnut. And as you get older, it grows bigger and bigger, like your nose and ears do throughout life. Great. So it can end up the size of a cantaloupe melon. What? <laughs> so if you imagine wow. that getting bigger and bigger and bigger, it squeezes takes up more space, yeah, squeezes yeah. your urethra, which is why men sometimes find they have to get up at night to have a wee. They find they've got a wee more during the day because they don't empty the bladder then fully. All mm. right. Mm -hmm. It also has a, a particular job. What does it do? The secretion of something I should know, but very don't good. Remember. Secretion of what? Can you give me, Can you give me a clue? So what's um so what's going through it? As in, so you've got this urine, obviously the bladder's so the urine's going through it, yeah. and, and there's a second tube that's joining it, Sperm. right? Yeah. So it makes the se it makes the seminal fluid. It makes oh, it makes basically okay, the, yeah. the 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 basting fluid <laughs> that goes with the sperm. Yeah. So really, the testicles will only be sending up maybe one to five percent of what comes out of you at the end. When you're having sex, they get stored in the prostate, and it's called the prostate emission, where it's basically send up this tube, stored in the prostate, and waits there for you to hit the point of no return. Yeah. So you know that bit before you hit the vinegar strokes, and you can kind of sense, if I don't stop now, yeah. I'm going to come. She's like, don't stop, and then you have to stop. <laughs> yeah. <'Cause> <laughs> and you ruin everything. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Someone's lived experience. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> um, but the point is, so you've got emission storing in there, and then you've got propulsion, which is when you've gone past the point of no return, and your prostate mixes it with all these fluids, um, and then your pelvic floor, which is the muscles there, squeeze it out. And that's propulsion where your fluid comes out. So where the ejaculate then spurts out of you. And as you get older, the distance you can fire that ejaculate gets less and less. Oh. And in some people, they start to fire it backwards into their bladder. Really? Yeah. So particularly if they take certain medications to relax their prostate, the, uh, the, the, the cum can go back into their bladder rather than in the other direction. And, and that causes yeah. problems? That, well, that, well, if, well, it's only a real problem if... Because because people have become really focused on ejaculate because it's mm. now a, a sexual uh, sign of how enjoyable things are, aren't you? Mm. Before, you know, if, if someone goes, 
It's like a, you know, a dusty desert. No one really cared. Just, you know, person didn't have to tidy themselves up afterwards, yeah. did they? Whereas now, you know, you, the volume of semen is, is, is a judgment on how exciting it was and how virile you are as a performer, <laughs> particularly in the gay world and in pornography. Yeah. You know, if you're a heavy comer, you do big loads. You know, that's kind of like, you know, look at Johnny Big Bollocks. USP. He does big loads. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, he's got a face like a prawn, but he does big loads. Um, so, you know, there are all these calling cards you can have. Uh, so that's what a prostate's for. Um, and your pre-cum, it makes your pre-cum as well. So people who've just got that bit of slippery, um, sort of clear fluid, that's coming from your prostate. It's a bit of lubricant mm -hmm. that, that's seeping out of you. Unfortunately, because of the emission process, you may be storing some sperm at that time. So that's why people can get pregnant even with the mm. tip and a bit of pre cum. Nah, that's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen to me. <laughs> that's that's, fine. that's what they all say. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So anyone who's dipping their wick before they pop the condom on, if the other person is, isn't on, you know, at contraception, then there's a likelihood of pregnancy. Yeah. Okay, so just something to warn you about. And, and finally, the, that there, the wrapping around the head. Sorry, which part? So you've got your got D. So we've got this this tube here yeah. mm -hmm. the wrapping around the head as in D itself uh, no no the, the bit that'd be wrapped around here the foreskin yes oh, oh okay. okay so what's the point of the foreskin to protect your to protect your helmet yeah to protect your bellend however it's also 20% of your sexually sensitive material because when you're fucking actually what you're really doing is the head of the penis is sliding mostly in and out of the foreskin and then surrounding that is the orifice so if you remove the foreskin, whilst you can still have enjoyable, pleasurable yeah. sex, you've actually cut off 20% of your sexually sensitive material. So, that, so people that are circumcised will be, will be impacted by that? Uh, potentially. I mean, they still have fun. There, yeah, there, yeah, there's, yeah. there's no suggestion that actually people have more or less fun. But in general, you are removing some sexually sensitive material. Plus also the head of the penis then becomes less sensitive yeah. because it's always exposed. Okay. So people who've been circumcised, the first few days after their circumcision, particularly as an adult, are not happy days. You have to go from boxes to briefs in quick time because every time it rubs against anything, you're like, because it feels quite so sensitive. Mm. But over time, you kind of build up a, a thicker skin layer, like a kind of skin clag helmet. I mean, it's not like smegma, don't get me wrong. But it's yeah. like a thicker <laughs> skin layer. So you feel a bit less. Oh, interesting. Uh, it also reduces your risk of HIV transmission, but that's not reason to do it, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, you've got D. What's Is D? It an erectile flexor muscle. Not flexor, but erectile tissue. Ah, oh, okay. So yeah, yeah that, that's your corpora cavernosa. There's two Porous basically su uh, sausage-shaped tubes. Um, and how long is the average penis, boys? In uh, five point five point four inches. Smaller. Interesting. Flaccid or erect? Erect. We'll go with erect. Oh, I was going flaccid. I'll I'll go. Wow. <laughs> Wow, Sean's just showing off there. <laughs> I'll say 4.8 based on your response. 5.1. 5.1. 5.1 inches, so 13.2 centimetres, the average. But remember, most men have eight inches because the rest of it's in their body. So about a third of the penis is actually within the body. Mm -hmm. Really? Uh, yeah, so that's what it is there. Uh, and that's where you can feel that filling in your undercarriage. Yeah. That's because the, the third that's in your body is filling up. Okay. So what you're really trying to say is when we're measuring our manhood, we should do it from the very back to the very tip. Absolutely. Pull the balls down as well. <laughs> <laughs> More no, the way the to earth. measure it is actually standing up, push push a, a tailor's tape, which is uh, which is uh, flexible, um, into the base of your pubic bone, right. and then along the top of the penis, taking into account any curving. And up next, we're going to uh, measure our penises. <laughs> this is your naked measure. This is your naked part of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to come back. the small in. print that we didn't see. But yeah, you did very well. No, you didn't. You did dreadfully. Yeah. But that's, that, that, that's, you know, that's, that's general. And most people don't know. You know. I've had a patient come into me and go, what's this? And I was like, that's your foreskin. And they're like, but they don't have it in the porn I'm watching. It's like, because you're watching American porn. Of course. And this person was in their 20s. And, and so I think there's a profound lack of sex education, or at least um, there's se the sex education that people receive has been in the past bloody dreadful. Um, so I think that's something we really need to address because if you know your bits and what they're for and how fun they can be, um, then actually, you know, you're fabulous. I mean, if people knew how much fun the clitoris was, then we'd all want one. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're jolly good time. So, no, so now that we have expertly found out how we should measure, measure <laughs> the size of our manhood, the question that everyone wants to know is, does size matter? I, I'm, I'm sure... 
I, I know what uh, you're going to say, and it's going to be something to do with the position of the G spot, or you only need a certain amount of length to give optimal pleasure. And obviously, it's something that can't be changed. A lot of men are insecure to, secure about, and I think that insecurity doesn't have a lot of premise. It's like you're watching pornography, like as your your expectation is incredibly skewed in terms of what the average male anatomy is meant to look like mm -hmm. and then if you start watching pornography young as well you're seeing all these beer moths of penises again this this uh, arm signal <laughs> and me uh me mega cocks. and you're probably like, you're probably like what, why don't i have a mega cock when yeah. you're younger um but, but yeah I, I'd, I'd say that it's it's a difficult one to well, I'm, I'm throwing this one to you. So, I mean, it, the, when, when the average penis size, because the average length of a, a vagina is eight centimeters mm -hmm. when it's not aroused. When, you know, when, it, when a woman's not aroused, eight centimeters. And that's what, if you're then trying to put in a 13 centimeter penis mm. into an unaroused vagina, that's a recipe what, for trouble. eight centimeters an inch? So eight centimeters, that's probably three, just over three and a bit. Oh, okay. So it's, it's you know, four inches is 10. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just over three inches. So it's you know not actually that much tissue to go the length of the vagina. Obviously, when uh, arousal happens for women, the vagina can become deeper mm -hmm. and longer. Um, however, if you've got a 10-inch penis, you know, you're know kind of trying to fuck their not spleen. Not a good time. Like, yeah, well... I mean, yeah. lots of people can't accommodate it. Yeah. And so it's, you know, it's not, and it's not a laugh. I mean, ha ha ha. Oh, yeah. it, it's great in terms of, you know, often they're fetishized and people go, oh, it's really hot that he's got a big dick. And you're like, yeah, but actually you try and have sex with that person and it can be really uncomfortable. So actually often men that have oversized penis, you know, yes, it, it might be great if you want a career in porn, but if you don't and want to have sex with regular people, it's actually a bit of an, a hindrance. So Mo, you've been on quite a journey, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, in the past decade or so, you know, you would have grown and evolved and learned a lot about yourself. You know, what do you know about yourself today that you wish you'd known when you first started on your journey? Oh, there's a couple of things. I feel like a big one is that the things you're most bothered about, bothered about in terms of insecurities and you think are the end of the world and be all or end all. Like I said at the start, the things that you think people are going to judge you for and look at you and be like, oh, what's wrong with that person? No one gives a shit. Like everyone's too obsessed with their own problems, their their own issues, their own insecurities to actually be bothered about you. And in the most nicest possible way, no one cares about you. It's not. <laughs> 50 years time you're gonna be dead anyway so it's like just do just <laughs> keep it keep it positive Mo. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's the truth though so there's what's so what does it matter like if that thing that you're worried about doing or that insecurity or thing that you're bothered about it's it's like you're gonna let that thing control and rule your life mm -hmm. by getting so caught up in your head about it and and it is yeah it's just getting a sense of perspective i guess about it and the other thing as well i, I guess you can tie into insecurities and these things whether it's your penis whether it's uh your, your, your weight, whatever it is. Obviously, if you, I do think you should do your best to improve yourself and improve your reality and get mm -hmm. healthier and fitter if you can. And that's something you, you want to do and is going to make your life better and you live longer. But the, the, the thing with, with insecurities, there's always going to be things that you can't change and things that you, you can't get over. And, and it's like the, the only way, not can't get over, you can't physically make amends for, per mm -hmm. se, like my leg, it's, it's probably never going to be better. And the only way to get over that insecurity is by leaning into it and looking for that thing that you fear and, and thinking, okay, what, what is it that really scares me in this situation? So like with my girlfriend, seeing my leg, what could I do to, to get over that thing? And, and what is that thing that gives me the most fear and almost putting yourself in that situation of fear in order to expand that comfort zone and grow as a person and grow out of that thing that is that insecurity that scares you. The, the, what's, what's the saying? The, the only way to grow is by stepping outside of your comfort zone and gradually stretching that boundary that was it i think i think you know what you've touched on there is incredibly powerful and that being able to make peace with your insecurities and probably understand that you know you are enough and whatever whatever you know you are exactly what you're meant to be and that's great and people will love you and you know want to mm. be around you regardless and in spite of whatever things you think are holding you back. Yeah. So something we love to do here on the men's manual, we actually have an actual men's manual. So we have so many amazing guests that come on the podcast. And something that we want to do is by the time we've wrapped, hopefully series 10 in a decade's time, we'll have some nuggets of wisdom and information from all of our guests um, that they can pop down 
in our green notebook and then it can there be it can exist as a guide to live by for for all the men out there so what i'm going to ask you to do is think of something it doesn't have to be related to what we've been discussing today that you would want to have as your entry into the men's manual and then share it with us you don't have to write it right now but you will have to write it today and we're going to start with you mo what bit of advice what bit of wisdom would you want to pass down and have as your entry in the men's manual do I write it down? Do I talk don't don't write it? it down yet. You're going to write it down at some point today. Can I have a little look at the others? <laughs> no, that's cheating. Oh. So what nugget of information or what sort of impactful bit of wisdom would you like to leave behind? I would probably say it's, we all suffer one of two things. It's the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. How much is not doing this thing actually costing you? Like It's very easy to live in a state of avoidance and aversion about doing something or dealing with something that you know needs to be dealt with and your life's probably not going to change that much if you avoid this thing but how much could it change if you actually tried to improve this thing or fix this thing that's bothering you and actually stepped outside of your comfort zone and embarked on that difficult journey embrace a difficult journey embrace a difficult journey if you want to put this yeah do okay. hard things embrace a difficult journey do hard things yeah great Toss it over there to our good doctor friend. You don't have to write. You don't have to yeah, write it right now. You can just. My handwriting is awful, uh, so it's probably easier not to speak. Well, you are um, a doctor, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to the law, really. Um, I think referring, obviously, to, to what you just said earlier. Um, don't make life harder than it needs to be. <laughs> you know, that's just summarised. I think what <laughs> you've been saying. You know, you can put your own barriers in the way to whatever form of success you're looking for. You know, there's already barriers in lots of ways. You know, maybe it's your body, maybe it's your physique, maybe it's your, uh, you know, your, your maximum intelligence level that may stop you achieving something. You know, I'm never going to play for Arsenal, but, that, but that's okay. Are you a gooner? Yes. My guy. <laughs> uh, My which guy. is depressing in a lot of ways. You know, it has been for many years. But, like, but I don't let that stop me, hopefully, enjoying the fact that I can have a good relationship. I can have, you know, I, I can do some sport, you know, the, the, uh, and also mediocre is fine. Like, you know, it, it, I, it, I would rather be mediocre and happy than extraordinary and miserable. That, that's exactly it. You know, you don't need to, tr so you don't need to make it so hard and you also don't need to try too hard. Just get on with it. Don't put yourself in your own way. Love that. So one of the best bits of advice I have, and this might be my entry into the men's manual, I haven't actually done it yet, was a friend of mine, uh, was talking about sex and he said a tip for you he's a bit he was a bit older he said a tip for you young ones is if ever you're in if ever you're not in the mood to have sex start having sex you quickly get in the mood and I genuinely think that is whenever whenever because sex is such an important part of a relationship right and it's one of those areas where you bond with your partner and it's so important and you know I've been in a relationship for 20 years plus and sex is still a massive part of our relationship. You know, we've got two kids, so trying to find time and energy and resources to be able to do it is, you know, you're, you're really scraping the barrel when you're trying to find those opportunities. But if one of you is not in the mood, not in the mood, quick, you know, start having sex, you quickly get in the mood. And that for me is, a, is absolutely a, a nugget of gold that I, mm, wish, I'd, okay. I wish I'd known sooner. And foreplay is sex. Oh, yeah. So, you know, when you, when you say you just start having sex, it's not that someone's just popping a dick in. It's actually, you know, it's not the penetrative act itself. That, for me, is kind of like dessert. <laughs> uh, you, know, the, the, you know, you wouldn't start your meal necessarily with dessert, but you can. Um, but I think, yeah, that's, that's really important because actually that building in that desire, making sure that actually, oh, oh maybe, no, maybe I do want that. You know, the, being available and open to it, I think is so important. Yeah, no, bang on. Okay, so that is it for another episode. That's episode seven of the Men's Manual. I want to say a huge thank you to both of you two. That was so much fun. Mo, thank you for coming on and sharing your incredibly inspiring and interesting story. Best of luck with your show coming up and please stay in touch with us here at the Men's Manual. And Dr. Anad, you have been an unbelievable guest. I'm really looking forward to spending a bit more time with you this afternoon where we'll be recording the bonus episode of The Men's Manual, which is The Men's Manual XY. But I'm your host, Sean Stafford. It's been a pleasure having this conversation. 
please, if you've enjoyed this podcast, like, subscribe, comment, and engage because all of those engagements and all of those interactions from you guys help other people find the podcast and helps with the success of the show. Again, thank you for listening. It's been a blast and I'll see you again next time.